All right, so this, the portion of Scripture here in Luke chapter 10 I'm going to be focusing in on is commonly known as the, the story of the Good Samaritan, right? We read through that whole entire story. And this is just one example of the greater topic of this sermon. And what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is sins of omission. So in the Bible, there are sins that you could commit that are commission, where you commit them, you actually do something that you're not supposed to do. So when you commit a sin, like, for example, the Bible says, think of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. So doing those things, if you were to kill, if you were to steal, you are committing a transgression, you are sinning against the Lord because you are actively doing something that God said not to do. But what we're going to be talking about this morning is sins of omission. So sins that you, these are things that you should be doing, but you don't do. And they're actually commandments of things that God says that you need to do this. And by not doing them, you're actually in sin. Now the whole point, that I was bringing this up right now, we preach hard on a lot of sin in this church. And it's not to just make you feel bad. Okay, the point isn't just to, to make you, to send you home, just like, oh man, I just feel real terrible. The point is, maybe it is to make you feel bad a little bit, but it's so that you can get godly sorrow that leadeth to repentance. The whole point is so that we can be better children of God. God has rules for us. God has things that he wants us to follow. So when we preach hard on sin, the whole point is that, hey, I didn't realize what I was doing was wrong. I didn't realize the Bible is actually real clear about this and I need to be doing this. So I'm going to change to be more pleasing to God so that God could bless me and I'm not just, just being displeasing unto our Savior. You know, the one that saved us from all of our sins and saved us from, a, from an eternity of hell. Hey, I love that God. I love Jesus Christ and I want to serve Him. So we're going to go through some examples this morning. And this is a really good example because you notice in this story, it starts off by... This man, he was a lawyer, I think. Yeah, a certain lawyer in verse 25. It says, up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this lawyer comes to him. And when it says he tempted him, he's testing him. Right? He's, 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 he's questioning Jesus Christ. It's not even necessarily because he really cares about the answer. He's tempting him. It's not, it's not that honest type of heart. But he says, um, you know, well, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus just asked him a question. He said, well, what does the law say? Right? What are you supposed to do? How, how do you read the Bible? What, what do you think it says? And he answered saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And that's a right answer because those two commandments encapsulate all of the law of God. Loving God with all of your heart. And, and think about this. So think about the arrogancy of someone who thinks that they're actually keeping that. Do you, can anyone here say that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind? That you are just completely serving God every second of the day in every single aspect that you are basically just a perfect person? Absolutely not. Of course not. We know we all fall short of that. Anyone who's honest with themselves knows that they fall short. And thy neighbor is thyself. So you're saying not only do you have to love God completely, but you also have to you know, be good unto everyone else. So it's, you know, when you think of the Ten Commandments, not killing, not stealing, well, you're not loving them as yourself if you do those things against them. That's why it encapsulates the whole law. And Jesus answered him, he says, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. Hey, and you know what? There's two ways to be saved and go to heaven. One is to be perfect. Keep all of the law. Keep everything and don't ever transgress. The problem with that is nobody can do it. <laughs> so we need plan B. We need, we need the, the blood of Jesus Christ to atone and save for us. So Jesus answers, but, but listen, look, at the, look at the mindset of the guy he's talking to. He says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Right? So he already knows I'm not keeping this. But he still wants to be justified. He wants to say, I'm doing what's right. So he's saying, well, who is my neighbor? Because I know I've done bad things to other people, but is that really my neighbor? And then Jesus gives this great example here of a man who gets beaten up. He's robbed. He's left in the gutter. Left, you know, he's hurt. He's injured. And I love the example because if you, you know, the more you read the Bible, the more you'll realize, you know, when I first started reading, when it says a priest and a Levite and a Samaritan, 
None of those things meant anything to me. It just, to me, I was just thinking, well, one person came by and they didn't do anything. Another person came by and they didn't do anything. And then the third person came by and they helped them out. And that's the one who is neighbor. But when you look at this, a priest. He says, a certain priest came by. This is supposed to be a godly man, right? This would be someone that everyone would look to and be like, oh, what a great man of God. He's saying, yeah, the priest, they, just walked, they, they crossed over to the other side of the street so they didn't even have to hear him or, or think about it and just, just kept going on their way. And a Levite, right? A Levite was, a, was, was someone uh, that was working in the service of the Lord. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a priest, but people working in the house of God. Again, another person who would be looked as, as a spiritual guy, a man of God, crossed the other side of the street and walked over. And Jesus uses these examples on purpose because especially in those, and you know what, it's, it's timeless. It's not just in those times, but in these times too. We have Pharisees. We have people that love to stand up and get all the praise and glory of men and make everyone else think how holy and righteous they are, but they just love the praise of men and not the praise of God. And they're hypocrites and inside they're full of dead men's bones. And these are the types of people that Jesus is saying, yeah, they think, you know, people look to them and think, oh, they've got to be saved. They've got to have eternal life because look at how great they are. And they, and they think they're following the law. And he said, those are the very people that, that the most simple commandment is saying, just loving your neighbor as yourself, not doing it. But the Samaritan and the see the Samaritans at those times were actually looked down upon. The Jews in Judea, in Judah, were... When the kingdom of Israel, well, I'll just do a real brief history on this. The kingdom of Israel split early on in, in, in the, nation, the nation of Israel's history. Judah and Israel. And the kings of Judah were typically more righteous. And the kings of Israel kind of got into more trouble and had more wicked kings and um, started following idols and things like that. They got, the, the, the nation of Israel got taken captive before Judah did. And they actually had their, their genealogies screwed up and they got intermingled with the heathen a lot more than the people, than the Jews in Judah kind of kept more their, their, their genealogy. So they were, they were and they, they put a lot of importance on this. Now in the New Testament, the Bible says, you know, to, to not worry about genealogies. So, you know, we don't care about them at all. It means nothing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, physically speaking, Abraham's your father. What matters is if Abraham's spiritually your father. Right. But um, so the mindset, though, at this time, and you get this, you read through the book of Acts, you read through, they were getting, you know, even the, the apostles were getting rebuked for this, for kind of thinking and giving preference and being a respecter of persons towards Jews over the Greeks, over, you know, the Gentiles, over anyone else. And that is something that God said is not the way they should be. But the Samaritans at that time, they were like mixed blood Jews, so when he uses the Samaritan, this example, you know, he's not the priest, he's not a Levite, he's not someone that's looked at and respected. He's kind of looked down upon as a lower second class citizen. But look at what he does. He's the one that comes and helps them. He puts them on his ass and, and, and gets them, you know, gets his wounds cleaned up, brings them to an inn and gets them a place to rest and pays the money and just says, here, you know, take care of this guy. I've got other things I've got to do, but I, I'm, you know, he, he did his diligence to make sure that this guy's taking care of him. He says, I'm going to be back this way, so whatever you have to spend extra to get him back up on his feet again, I'll pay you back. That's the man who, did, um, who was a neighbor unto, uh, you know, unto somebody. Now, flip over to Leviticus 19. That's where I had you originally keep a, a bookmarker at. In Leviticus 19... We're actually going to see this concept of loving your neighbor as yourself. It's not something new to the New Testament. A lot of people think that it's just the New Testament, but actually it's not. Leviticus 19, look at verse number 18. In Leviticus, when you start reading Leviticus 18, 19, 20, I mean, you're getting really in depth in the law. This is God's law, you know, thou shalt not do this, and not, don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do this, and don't do this. And this is, this is a part of the Bible that people like to mock and criticize these days because it's not politically correct to believe that these are actually wholesome, righteous, godly laws that, that God ordained and instituted, you know, like Leviticus 20.13. That says that, you know, if mankind shall lie with man, he shall lie with woman. They both shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's a righteous law of God. That's, right. That's what God thinks about homosexuality. Now, these days, you say that and, and, and 
you know, people want to want to tear your head off or something. But um, what's real interesting is that Leviticus 18 talks about that. Leviticus 20 talks about that. But no one wants to go to Leviticus 19. Right in between those two chapters, verse 18 says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Right there in the Old Testament law, God saying, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. It's not that God was some meanie and some, you know, really horrible, angry God in the Old Testament, but now he's just all love in the New Testament. No, he's been the same God all the time. That's right. All the time through. So all of these, you could call them negative commandments, I don't think they're negative, but they're still applicable today. It's still the same God. He still feels the same way about this stuff, but just as much as he did about loving your neighbor as yourself. So this is our first sin, though, the sin of omission. Because you might be able to get to a point where you say, you know what, I'm not, you know, I'm not murdering, right? Thank you. Hopefully everyone's at that point now, but <laughs> I'm not murdering. I'm not stealing. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing these things. I'm looking at God's law and I'm keeping myself from doing these things. But are you loving your neighbor as yourself? That would be a sin of omission. Are you one of the people that when you see somebody in need, you're passing over on the other side. You're saying, well, I'm just too busy. I got to get to work. I got other things going on. I can't help this person. That's not being a neighbor. And especially these days, I see it all the time. It's kind of weird. You, know, you see people that, are, that could be stranded or in trouble and oftentimes with vehicles, you know, you get real far from places and you see cars just going by and 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 going by. It's like, is anyone even going to stop? Well, I believe as Christians, you know, if we see someone that's in distress, that's in need, you know, we ought to be able to help them out. I mean, that's the right thing to do. Now, obviously, especially with like women or, or people, you know, you, if you're a little bit older, you need to be wise and, and understand, you know, be able to, to, to keep yourself safe in situations. But there's ways that you can do that and maintain a, a, a you know, safe distance to be able to, to make sure you're not going to get in trouble yourself. But, um, you know, just using a little bit of wisdom in those situations, I still think it's our duty to be a neighbor you know, love, love your neighbor as yourself and to look at someone and be like, man, you know, what if I were in that position? What would I want someone to do for me? I mean, and that's basically treating your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. It's just putting yourself in their shoes. How would, how would I want them to treat me? Would I want every car to just pass by me and I'm just walking and walking and walking and walking to try to find like a phone or something to, to get some help? Whatever the case may be. I mean, that's just a real common example. But there's so many different things that, that, that happen in our life. And, and people that you run across and, and things that you see. And, I mean, you could see someone getting beat up. Maybe they, you know, someone just got beat up and, and the guy ran away and there's just someone laying in the street. I mean, it could happen. That's what happened to this guy in the story. You know, it's our job to go over there and help him out. And when you don't do it, that's a sin of omission. That's something that you're supposed to be doing, that God's law says that you're supposed to be doing and you don't do it. You're in Leviticus 19. Jump down to verse number 34 because I find this to be very interesting as well. And this is also in the Old Testament law. Remember how I mentioned about the Samaritan versus the Jew and the way that they looked at other people. Look at what God's law says in verse 34. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. A stranger means a foreigner, someone that's not originally from your land, someone else that's come now and he's joined to be part of your land. He is a worshiper of the Lord. He is a, now joined himself to Israel. But he's a stranger. He's saying you don't treat them any different than you treat any of your other brethren. That's right. But again, here's another aspect of the law that kind of went by the wayside. And you know, this is important because this still goes on today. I mean, this has been going on all throughout history. You have racism. You got people who, you know, just because someone's skin color is darker than another or lighter than another or whatever the case may be, they're going to think they're going to treat somebody different. Well, I'll tell you what, in this house, this is supposed to be the house of God. We're going to treat everybody the same because everyone here should be believers in Jesus Christ and there are brothers and sisters in Christ. So we believe, you know, they're going to treat them just like everybody else. I don't care who, I don't care if they can't speak English, you know, whatever the case may be, right? We're not going to be discriminating against other people that are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to love them as ourselves. And this, this really needs to go a long way. This is in God's law. 
And if you're not doing that, if you're partial, if you're a respecter of persons, that's another sin of omission. That's something that you're not doing right that you should be doing. Uh, jump up here to verse number 32. Now this is... <laughs> another, another thing, even in this country, in our culture, that has, that has gone and been for almost completely forgotten. Verse number 32, because we're talking about sins of omission, right? So most of the commandments are saying, thou shalt not. That's what most of them are. And that would be a sin of commission when you do something like that. But a sin of omission, look at verse 32, thou shalt. So here's a thou shalt sin, uh, commandment. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. So I'm respecting older people. When people come in that have a hoary means like, a, like it's a, a lighter white, you know, it's just sh uh, showing older age. When someone comes in and, and the hoary head says, you, right, you get up. If you're sitting down, you get up and you show respect unto that person. Now, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that's just weird cultural thing that they did back in the 50s or something. But no, that's biblically based. Right. That's one of those things. I mean, the Bible's saying right here, right. say, look, this is what you need to do. You show respect unto your elders. You show respect unto those people. You stand up. You get up and show your respect unto them when, when they walk into the room. Not, not, it's not even being taught these days. I mean, kids these days and, and, and people in general are sinning through ignorance because they don't even know. And this stuff isn't being taught and being preached in, in, in any way, shape, or form. Whether it be in a school. I know they used to teach this stuff in schools. Manners and, and the things that you do and, and the way that you keep yourself. And that stopped even before I started going to school. Now, I'm 39 and, and you know, I was going to school in the 80s and that was already out the window. But... This is important, and these are things that, you know, the Bible says, God says, thou shalt do this. Let's make sure we're doing it. Let's, let's treat our neighbor as ourselves. Let's, let's, let's rise up before the hoary head. Let's show that respect unto people that are, the Bible says are worthy of respect. Look, there's a lot of wisdom in old age, and see, it's a whole mindset. Youth always thinks that they know everything, and they know better than you, and I just, but, but you don't understand. I know, you know. You don't know. Okay? Listen, listen up. If you're younger, you have a lot to learn. I still have a lot to learn. But we all need to get to the point where we could recognize people that have been here for a long amount of time have gained a lot of wisdom even just through experience. Even people who maybe don't know the Bible very well just because they've been on this earth for a long time have been through a lot of things and have seen a lot of things they gain wisdom and deserve our respect. Enough to be able to stand up when they walk in the room. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Because going along those same lines of, of having that respect and, and being able to show respect unto elders is the commandment and the Ten Commandments that would be another sin of omission. The Bible says to honor your father and mother. That's something you're supposed to do. It's not something you're not supposed to you know, it's, it's not one of those sins that you're not supposed to do. You say, say, no, you need to honor your father and mother. And if you're not honoring your father and mother, then you are sinning. Now, let's take a look at Mark chapter 7, verse number 9. There's a lot of misunderstanding about the word honor in the Bible. Honor is one of those words that, that has a, it's multifaceted in its meaning. It's more than just respect. Excuse me. The common usage of honor today is respect. That's, that's what most people think of. You know, you think of honoring somebody, you're showing respect unto them. But in the Bible, we're going to see that honoring goes beyond. It, it still is respect, absolutely. But it's, it's more than that. It's the type of respect where you are caring for them when they need it. So let's look at Mark 7, verse number 9, and we'll see a, kind of a better explanation than what I'm trying to, to say with my own words right now. Verse number 9 says, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. This is Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. Verse number 10, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. So Jesus Christ is quoting the law to the Pharisees, saying, look, the Bible says, God's word says, you need to honor your father and mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. And there's Jesus reaffirming that law that so many people like to mock. 
And people will say, oh, are you supposed to put to death a, a disobedient child? No, that's not what the Bible says. But someone that curses their father or mother, now what's a curse? Well, think, think about first, what's a blessing? A blessing is if um, all throughout the Bible you see people giving blessings of, you know, you're going to have, you know, I pray that you have all of this, you know, increase in land and increase in children and, and, and all these good things going to happen to you. Those are blessings. So the flip side of that, cursings, is when you're wishing bad things and evil things on people. So like if a child were to say, I hope you die and go to hell to their parent, to a mother or father, that's a curse. That is a curse. And according to the Old Testament law, the Bible says that they need to be put to death. That is one of those lines of respect that you said, you just don't cross this line. God is really, really serious about showing that level, about having certain levels of respect. It keeps the whole foundation of our society in place, having the strong family unit. And when you could grow up having that type of respect for your parents, guess what? You'll, you'll also be able to have that type of respect for God, for your heavenly father. So Jesus is, is saying this, look, you guys reject the commandments. You reject Moses. He says, just to keep your own tradition. He's going to explain it now a little bit further. He quoted, honor your father and mother, and whoso curseth father and mother, let him die the death. Verse number 11. But ye say, so but this is what you're saying, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his mother or his father, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things you do, do ye. So he's saying here, you are making God's commandments of none effect. The commandment was honor your father and mother. He says, you are completely negating that. You are not following that commandment. How were they not following it? He says, because you, you, set, you allow people to no more do anything, to do anything. So you see there, honor your father and mother, it's not just respect. It's not just when you have words with them and you just, you just, you just show them reverence and respect. It's more, has more to do with, with even doing things for them and taking care of them and showing respect in that manner. And that's where in verse 11 he says, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, it is a, a gift by whatsoever thou mightst be profited by me. So, taking care of your, your parents. And, and this, again, our society is so backwards these days. When, when mothers and fathers are getting old now, the, the, what children are doing is they're sending them off to a home. They're, they're sending them off to be cared for by someone else or whatever. Now, I understand there are certain situations where people need a lot of care, like a real lot of care. And they need maybe a specialized help to take care of people. I'm not downing people that do that. But these days, I mean, people are just kind of forsaking their parents and, and letting, letting them go through just, well, let the government take care of them or whatever. No, the Bible says that you need to take care of them. Hey, your parents are the ones that raised you and brought you up and made sure that you were fed and your diapers were changed and, and everything else along the way. We need to then show that same respect when our parents get to the age where they're not able to do as much anymore. We need to honor them in taking care of them. And if you're a children, I mean, you know, as a child, it's your responsibility to help to care for your parents and not just to say well you just count yourself lucky mom and dad whatever it is that I do do for you that's the way they made the word of God of none effect Jesus saying no that's your duty to take care of your mother and your father right. it's that's your that's your responsibility don't say that they're lucky you're lucky if God doesn't cloud up and rain on you for for disrespecting your parents in that way and not honoring your parents it's a big deal. It's important the way the things that we do for our parents to show our honor for them and by honoring them is, is performing actions and doing them. And that's what the Bible says. So if we're not honoring our mother and father, one way is, first of all, treat them with respect when you speak to them, obviously. But even more than that, do your duty as a child to honor them in their time of need. Just like they did for your time of need when you were growing up. And that's the way that we honor our father and our mother. Now, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. You're in Mark. Flip over a little bit more to the right in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to see our next sin of omission. Now, when I was preparing for this sermon, I was trying to be real careful about, there's a lot of things that the Bible says that we should do. 
Things that, that are imperative statements even that are telling you to do this. But I don't necessarily believe that they're all sins by not doing them. For example, a good example of an imperative statement is praise ye the Lord. It happens over and over again through the book of Psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's telling you to do something. It's saying, hey, praise God. And it gives you all the reasons for the book of Psalms. Praise the God for he's good, for his mercy endureth forever, for his long suffering. You know, all these great reasons to praise him. But I'm not convinced that it's necessarily a sin to not praise God. Is it something we should do? Absolutely. But there's nowhere that I could find where the Bible's saying that, like, if you don't do this, you're sinning. And I think one of the reasons for that is that God wants us out of our own hearts to show our praise to him. So he's not requiring us to do it by saying it's a sin by not doing it. Okay. But everything I'm showing you this morning, I could prove, and that's what I want to prove, that these are sins by not doing them. Not loving your neighbors. So we saw it in the Old Testament law. Right. Honoring your father and mother. It's in the Ten Commandments. Right? You, can't, you can't get any more specific than that about uh, you know, giving you proof. But Hebrews 10, we're going to see here that it's a sin to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, you can come up to your own conclusion about forsaking and what exactly that entails. So, like, obviously, church is an assembly. When you go to church, it's an assembling of ourselves of like-minded believers together in one place to, to learn from God's Word, to sing praises unto God, to have fellowship, to edify one another. And we'll see that here. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So he's saying, as you know, brothers and sisters of Christ, let's consider each other, let's think about each other, and provoke each other unto love, unto good works, to, you know, to encouragement, to be there for each other. And he says in verse 25, continuing on, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But look at verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversary. So the reason why I included this in the sermon is because he follows up not for saying the same thing of ourselves together by saying, for if we sin willfully. And it's all in context there. The, the for if we sin willfully is referring to what he just said of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. He said, if you decide, you know what, I'm just going to stay home. I'm not going to congregate with other believers. I'm not going to do this. You're sinning willfully. You're sinning a sin of omission by not going out and, and joining yourself with other believers. Now, you could say, well, what does forsaking mean? Now, if you miss a Sunday or whatever, you're not forsaking the assembly, right? But if you just never go to church... I think that's forsaking. I mean, that's obviously forsaking. And you can decide for yourself what you feel is forsaking, or where you might be in danger of, of maybe not doing what you should be doing. So I'm not saying you have to be here for every single service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all the time. And if you don't, you're forsaking the assembly. I don't believe that for a second. Now, the Bible does say, you know, so much the more as you see the day approaching. I think church is really important, and I think we should be in here as much as possible. I think we should be edifying each other. We should be learning. We should be growing. We should be doing. The, the closer we get to the end times, the more we need each other, the more we need to be in a group together. But, you know, just make sure you're not forsaking that assembling. Because that will be considered a sin of omission. It's something you're supposed to be doing. God wants you gathering together and keeping yourself on track because here's the thing and, and I've I've done this personally in my life I got saved when I was 20 years old but it took me years before I actually kind of got on track and, and, and got my life straight on, on what I needed to be doing God had to kind of give me a little bit of discipline along the way but in your heart you think and, and I understand this completely you think, oh, you know what, I really want to serve God. Or, you know, but what happened in my life was the cares of this world, the other things I wanted to do were choking out the, 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 the fruit. And I love doing all these various things, some of them sinful, some of them not, but they kept me away from, from the, the assembly, from going to church, from doing the right thing. And I would think, yeah, you know what, every once in a while, I really need to get back, I need to read the Bible, and I'm, I'm just going to start reading God's Word. So a lot of people think, I don't need church. I'm just going to get in the Bible and read it right away. Guess what? 
it lasts only so long. Because you're going to get distracted again. And one of the things that you get by assembling together with other believers is encouragement and edification and will help get strength to keep you going through this Christian life and doing all the things that we should be doing like reading your Bible and praying and kind of getting that reminder and being around other people doing similar things that will give you the encouragement to keep going and to keep doing these things and to not forget them and not let them slip your mind because all these other th things you're keeping yourself busy with is distracting you. But there's many reasons to be in church and the Bible says here, look, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be able to gather together. And you know what? It doesn't have to be this church, but find another church that has believers, right? I mean, just make sure you're not forsaking this commandment just wherever it may be. Um, join yourself together with other believers and, and have an assembly. Uh, turn, if you would, to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, so if you go back to Matthew, just go back a couple pages, Malachi chapter number 3. This is a doctrine that's been attacked lately, um, especially on the internet. There's a, there's a growing, I don't know how much it's growing, but the house church movement out there where people think that like we shouldn't be gathering in buildings or anything like that. You just you know, go to a house and, and assemble with people that way. And there's multiple pastors in these houses. And it, it's kind of, I'm not even going to go into all the details on what they believe. Now, I have no problem with people meeting in a house. We met in a house. Our church started off in my house, in my living room. That's where it started. But it was still church. What you see today in, in, in the order of service and everything that we're doing and the Bible teaching and the singing and everything else is exactly the same. We just happened to meet in my house. The building doesn't matter. The building doesn't make a church. Church is a congregation. It's a group of people. So we could be meeting outside under that tree and, and it's church. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter about the building. But the house church movement kind of emphasizes more like you need to be in a house. or you know, It's like, no, it, do, it, it doesn't matter the actual structure that you're in. But that same group of people kind of have an influence on, on people on the internet. And uh, they'll tell you then also that we are not required in the New Testament to pay a tithe. I disagree with that. I work a full-time job. I pay a tithe. I pay the tithe as long as I've been going to church. And I believe it's right. We look at Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. The Bible says, Will a man rob God? Think about that. Well, man, are you going to rob God? I would, <laughs> like, what are you going to do? Stick up God. But, but this is what he's saying. Are you really going to have the, the guts to rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, well, where have we robbed you? How did, what do you mean we robbed you? We didn't rob you. In tithes and offerings. Verse 9, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So with the commandment, and we could go into, I'm not going to prove from all the other, I've preached entire sermons about tithing and, and why it's scriptural, but he just gives you one verse here saying, look, just test me with it, you know, because a lot of people will say, well, I'm too poor, I don't have any money, how can I tithe? I need every penny that I have right now to go towards what, you know, it's for my expenses and everything else, and God's saying, look, just prove me. If you're willing to just be obedient, you know, it's 10%. That's, that's, that's what a tithe means. It's 10% of your income. Whatever it is, when I give you an increase, because it's, it's the tithe of your increase, when, when God's blessed you, you have an increase, he's saying, just give me back one out of 10 and, and test me and we'll see if I won't just, just bless you for doing that, for being obedient and, and you'll be taken care of. And the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, and that was in context, in reference to people saying, well, what shall we eat? What shall we wear? You know, what are we going to do? How am I going to know that I have food tomorrow? He says, look, I take care of the birds. I take care of the I take care of all these other things. You think I'm not going to take care of you? God knows what our needs are. The problem is that we have a tendency to think that our needs, what we think our needs are not really needs. See, God says your needs, you need to be fed and you need to be clothed. And the Bible says, with such things, to be there with content. That's what he says. You know, we think our needs is, well, I need to have a car. I need to have this. I need to have a house. Says, so the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He told someone I wanted to follow him. He said, look, I don't even have a home. Okay? But Jesus had what he needed. Didn't even have a home. 
And it's, it's a way of thinking. Now, we're rich in this country. Just by, Even our poor people are rich with what we have in comparison to what, we, what other people and all throughout history have had. You know, having the, the, the air conditioning, right? <laughs> having heat, having these sources, having so many different resources and um, things available to us. We really have to have the proper perspective. And um, anyways, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. You know, God's just saying, we, you know, you need to be paying your tithe. And if you don't do it, then you're robbing from God. And uh, that's, I'm going to leave that there. You can take it for this. And, you know, I personally, I don't care what you do with your money. It doesn't matter to me. But I'm going to preach what the Bible says. Amen. So I'm not some money hungry. Anyone that knows me, I'm not some money hungry guy. You know, you do whatever you want. I don't care. That's between you and God, just like everything else. I'm going to preach the Bible. If you go out and you never do any of these things, that's up to you. That's between you and God. Okay, but I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. And this is what the Bible says here. So you can take it or leave it. Uh, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. There's another sin of omission, and I'll just read it for you. And specifically for the men. Now, we want to talk about things. If you want to get yourself right with God, there's some, there's some things that are just really easy to do. And this should be one of them. The Bible says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? People say, why, do you, why does God care about the length of my hair? Well, read all of 1 Corinthians 11 and it, and it goes through the length of people's hair and having a covering on yourself. But what I like about this is just it's so easy. Like, why would it be so hard to just get a haircut? You know, guys. And the sin of omission there would be like if you just never get a haircut, right? You'd be like, I just, just never going to get a haircut again. Well, you'd actually be sinning because the Bible says that's a shame for a man to have long hair. But um, anyways, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 22, verse number one. This has to do with even just finding things like lost and found items, right? Things you come across that, that don't belong to you. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. So this is talking about, first of all, just helping out. Like you see, you know, let's say you see my dog got out of the yard, right? You see they got out or one of my, or you know, whatever, and kind of like the, the priest and the Levite, you just go on the other side of the road and you just, you know, I didn't see that, right? And that's a sin. And you need to go and help out. Don't hide yourself. Don't be like, oh, I didn't see that. You know, if you see it, go and help out. Verse number two, and if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. So he's saying, look, so if you see something, you say, well, I don't know who this really belongs to. I, I don't know that person. You know, I don't know who this is. Well, you still take it in and take care of it. And then when, when, he comes, when the guy comes around looking, hey, have you seen this? You know, you give it to him. Now, I, I've dealt with something like this personally before when I was in college. And it, it's kind of a silly example, but it happens. And it happens all the time where people think that they could find things and all of a sudden it belongs to them. You know, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? Well, I don't, that's not biblical. That's not the way that we should be living. You know, you shouldn't just, just think that all of a sudden, just because you found something that it belongs to you, especially when it's apparent, you know, it's not like you're going out and like digging up gold in the mountains or something. I mean, you're finding something that belonged to somebody else. It's property that belongs to someone else. When I was in college, there was a, a computer lab that, that I had to do. I was doing work. I was in an engineering school. And uh, I brought this whole big case of CDs, which I don't own anymore, but... <laughs> I had this big case of CDs. I was listening to music while I, was, while I was doing my work. And I left and forgot to take them. And then like hours later, I came back and there was only like two guys in there. Like, oh man, like have you guys seen this? I'm looking for this. Yeah, nope, nope, I haven't seen it. But the, the, the lab was locked and it had a little magnetic key card. So they had a log of everybody that, that came and went. And when I, when I reported it and said, you know, I was asking, hey, did anyone turn this in or whatever, they were able to find out those guys that were in there that said, nope, 
didn't see it, don't know anything about it, they actually took it. I ended up getting it back. But, the, but see, that's the type of thing. That's sinful. That's wicked. That's wrong. To just be taking other people's things. You see it. You know it. And then someone comes looking for it. He's like, give it back to them. It belongs to them. You're stealing when you don't give it back to them. The property belongs to them. But we need to make sure that he says, look, don't, don't even just let it, you know, in this case, the ox, don't let it just wander around. Hey, take it in. You know, take care of it. Again, it's, it's another aspect of treating your neighbor as yourself, right? What would you want someone to do? Would you want someone to help take care of your stuff and, and to kind of keep watch over it because something happened and got out? Or would you just want it just wandering around so that you know, an animal could go and kill it or whatever? Verse 3 says, In like manner shalt thou do with his ass, and so shalt thou do with his raiment, so his clothing, and with all lost things of thy brothers, which he hath lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise. Thou mayest not hide thyself. So we have an obligation, according to God, to help out. When you see things, to get involved, to help out, not to hide yourself, not to remove yourself from the situation, but to help out your brothers and sisters in Christ, or anybody for that matter. It doesn't even say your brothers. I mean, if someone's lost something, help them out. Turn if you to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Last place I'll have you turn this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This might strike some of you as odd. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because again, we live in, in a, even in a Christian, the overall Christian world today has kind of embraced this concept of not judging, never judge. And they'll read Matthew chapter 7 and they'll stop after two words where it says judge not. Well, the whole chapter says a lot more than just judge not. It says judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. So you <laughs> what it teaches is that not to be a hypocrite right. in your judgment. You should, I mean, if you're doing something, if you're guilty of something and you're going to judge someone else for doing the same things that you're guilty of doing, that is unrighteous judgment. You're not supposed to be doing that. That is completely against what God is saying. And that's what Matthew 7 is talking about. But there are definitely times when we do need to judge and we need to judge righteously. So here's another sin of omission is that if you just are never judging, you're in sin. And I'll I'll, we'll see in a specific example of this, right? So it's not just judging everybody all the time for all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll see the context of an area that we definitely need to make sure that we are judging righteously in and that we're not just uh, allowing all kinds of wickedness and sin to creep into the church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. Bob reads, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already. So Paul's saying, I've already judged this matter that you are not judging appropriately. He says, As though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, would ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul is rebuking the church at Corinth. This is a church, and we just got through a whole series on 1 Corinthians, our Wednesday night Bible study. There are a lot of things they were doing that were wrong. A lot of things they needed to be corrected on. A lot of things they needed to be straightened up. What was happening here in their church is that there was a member of their congregation that was coming in, and he was in open fornication with his father's wife. Now, I assume that his father was divorced, and he had now taken this woman as his concubine or whatever. He's in fornication with her. And it's just known throughout the church. And here's the problem. It was being accepted. It was being tolerated within the church as no one wanted to say anything to this person. Nobody brought it up. Nobody corrected this problem. And see, this is an area within our church where judgment needs to happen. This is not a church that just says, everybody welcome. It sounds good, but it's not true. That's not the way this church operates, at least. I mean, other people may do that. Everybody is not welcome here. Now, we're going to go out and try to get people saved. And we're going to try to lead them to Christ. And we're going to try to bring them in and disciple them and get them on the right path and do that. Yes, in that sense, you know, we're, we're trying to reach everybody. But not everybody's welcome in this church. Jump down to verse number 11. Paul lays out 
the way that the church needs to operate and who needs to go. Verse number 11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So he says very specifically, if someone's called a brother, someone's known as a brother in Christ, it's a little bit different. That's why I make sure we're clear about this. People need an opportunity to grow. So when someone first gets saved and they first come to church, right? If they're a drunk because they just got saved and they, you know, whatever, like, we're not just going to kick them out immediately. People need an opportunity to grow as a new believer, but they're also not someone who's just known as a brother. So like, when it, the church that I was going to before I was sent out to pastor, you know, I was Brother Dave. Right? Well, anyways, Brother Dave, Brother Dave, right? We have Brother Sebastian here. People have been coming, you know, they... They've been coming to church. They know what the Bible says. You know, they're a brother in Christ. They're kind of established as a brother. Somebody like that now becomes a drunkard or a fornicator or, you know, any of these other sins that are mentioned here. He's saying, you know what? Those people got to go. And the whole point is it's for their own good. Sometimes people need tough love. And he explains further that you know, when they get right with God, welcome them back in. You know, you don't, you, don't, you don't hold it over their heads again. When they get right with God, hey, come right back in. You are welcome here again. And we will absolutely, with open arms, embrace it. Come, come on back in, brother. But see, the, the, the teaching is that a little leaven leavens a whole lump. When you start letting sin be tolerated and accepted within the church, other people see that and look at that and say, oh, okay, well, I guess this is okay. Oh, no one's going to say anything about this. Well, that's not a big deal. I guess that's okay then. I guess we're all just a bunch of hypocrites that just say one thing, but we're all just out doing a bunch of other things. No. We're not just a bunch of hypocrites. I mean, everybody to some degree has a level of hypocrisy because we're all sinners. But not everybody's a fornicator. Not everybody's a drunkard. Not everyone's an idolater. Not everyone is covetous. Okay? These are major sins. These are big deals. And by the way, in this church, we operate off of the sins listed here. We don't just add whatever we feel to that either. We don't just add to God's word and just say, well, if you're doing this sin because I don't like it, then you're not allowed in here either. You know, no, it's what he's saying here are specific sins. Uh, an extortioner? He's saying, look, don't even sit down to eat with those people. If they're a brother, because they should know better. It's not the world. He's saying, look... I, I told you before in epistle not to company with fornicators. And he said this earlier in the chapter. He's saying, but I'm not talking about the world because then you just have to go out of the world completely. Like, like you wouldn't be able to talk to anyone out in the world because there, there, you know, there's so much of the sin going on in the world. But he's saying, I'm talking about within the church. I'm talking about among the brothers and sisters that you need to make sure that you are not just keeping good relationships with people who are involved in these serious sins when they're called a brother. And that's what the Bible says. They said, look, don't even eat with them. Don't go out to eat with them. They need to be put out. And he says, to deliver such an one unto Satan, which is what he, the judgment, the judging that Paul did for the man that was in fornication with his father's wife. He said, this is how you deal with somebody like that. You can't just allow that to go on in the church. It's going to ruin and destroy the church. They need to be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the, set of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So he says, verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. This is the judgment that needs to be going on in churches today. To keep them a righteous place. I mean, it's a place for God's people to be, to be congregated and gathered together and we need to make sure that the leaven isn't going to leaven the whole lump here. So by just allowing all kinds of rampant sin to just go on and take place within the church is a sin of omission by not dealing with it. Oh, I, you know what? I told you, I'm sorry, I was incorrect. There is one more place I want you to turn, James chapter 4. I said, I know I said that was the last place we could turn is 1 Corinthians 5. But I want you to see this in James chapter 4. It's my last point. And it's an important point, so I want you to see James chapter 4. <clears throat> 
One last sin of omission we're going to go over this morning and we're done. We'll read it in context here. We'll start in verse number 13. James chapter 4, verse number 13. The Bible reads, Go to now you that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So this is a perfect example of a sin of omission. When you know to do good and you don't do it. And we've seen examples of that, you know, with the lost and found items, treating your neighbor as yourself, you know, the, 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 man, the Good Samaritan story. Those are all examples of knowing to do good. I know I should help. And when you don't do it, it's a sin. Now, in the context here, though, that's why I wanted to read the context. It's very important because it sort of drives home my last point. What he's saying here is people are saying today or tomorrow. So in the future, we're going to go into this city. We're going to do that. We're going to be here. You know, we're going we're to buy something. We're going to get gain. We're going to do all of these things. We got all these great plans. And they're boasting about it and rejoicing in their boastings, just saying, like, as if they already happened of what they're going to do in the future. And he's saying, no, you know, what you ought to be saying is, if the Lord will, we'll do this or we'll do that. And then he says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So they're boasting about all these great, all this money they're going to make and everything else. He's saying, you need to be focused on doing what's right and doing what's good instead of boasting about these other things you haven't even done yet. And the last point I want to make is that some people have a tendency to put off doing things that they know they should be doing for a later date. And we need to make sure if you know it's good to do now and you're not doing it, it's a sin. Don't be saying, oh, in the future, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Here's a good example with baptism, right? Once you know that you're saved and the Bible teaches, hey, you're saved, you need to get baptized. This is something that God, it's a, it's a commandment of the Lord that you get baptized. And you don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 10, verse 48, it says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. It's a commandment, it's something that we ought to do. It's this first step of obedience uh, uh, to God of just openly showing, hey, I'm a believer in Christ and getting baptized. But if you know that that's something that you ought to do, because you've already been saved. You know, hey, I've been saved. I know what it's about. And I know I should be baptized. But you say, you know what? I'm just going to put it off. I'm not ready to get baptized yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that in a year from now. I'm going to do that in two years from now. Well, that would be a sin. Because you know to do good. You know this is something you ought to be doing. And you're not doing it. Another example would be winning souls. Going out and winning people to Christ. A lot of people say, well... I know it's something I should be doing. I know I need to go out soul winning, but I'm not ready to do it right now. I'll, just, I'll do that later. I'll do that in a year from now. I'll do that in six months. I'll do, it, I'll do it in the future at some point. If you know to do good and you're not doing it now, it's a sin. You're not doing something that you're supposed to be doing. And that is the Great Commission. Right? Mark 16, 15 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was a commandment from Jesus Christ, like his last words to his disciples before he sent it up into heaven, saying, look, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what your life is all about. You're saved. Go get other people saved. Go show them the love of God. Go show them the salvation through Jesus Christ. This is what everything's about. Amen. That's it. This is the big deal. This is the reason why you need to be keeping your life and getting your life in order and do all this other stuff, Father God, is so that you can be the most effective worker and laborer for Jesus Christ. The, the, the very first chapter we read in the sermon, Luke chapter 10, or, um, starts off with, you know, fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers be few. God has called out laborers to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. He's commanded us to do it. I just showed you one scripture this morning, so there should be nobody in here that doesn't know that that's something that we need to do. But if you decide not to do it, you're in sin.
because you know to do good. I know it's good. Who here doesn't know that it's a good thing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they could get saved, hear God's word, and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and go to heaven forever and, and, and escape an eternity of damnation in hell? Everybody knows that's a good thing. We know it's a good thing to do. If you know to do good and do it not, it's a sin. I'm here, as I mentioned at the very beginning, sir, I'm here trying to help. I'm not saying that I am perfect. I know that nobody is perfect, but let's strive to do the things that we're supposed to do. Let, let's not do the things we're not supposed to do, right? Let, let's stay away from those things, but let's make sure that we're not sinning by omission, by, by not doing the things that God has called us to do, that, that we're supposed to be doing with our life. Let's, let's help people in need. Let's rise before the hoary head. Let's give respect unto our mother and father. Let's do these things. Let's, let's live the life not only by not doing the bad things, let's do the good things. Let's preach the gospel. It's a, it's a, it's a multifaceted life that we have here. Let's make sure that we're, we're trying to keep ourselves as much as possible from sin. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful words and, and instruction that you've given us, dear Lord. Stir up our spirits this morning. Help us to be edified through each other, dear God. I know there's a lot of people here that love Christ and that want to serve you, dear Lord. I pray that you please give us the strength and give us the boldness to be able to do the things that that you expect of us, dear God. Um, oftentimes, there's fears involved. You know, people putting things off, whether it be baptism or, or soul winning or anything else in their life, but they know it's good. But there might be some kind of a fear involved, dear Lord. We know that that fear is not from you. I pray that you please help us all to strengthen each other so that there wouldn't be a fear of being able to, to bring up the gospel and, and to do the things that you expect us to do and that you've called us to do, dear Lord. And... Uh, we pray that you would please just bless everyone this morning as we, after we leave our, our separate ways and, and help us this afternoon to go out and win people to Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.